Hello, I'm Peter de Costa, and I'm a visiting professor at the Monterey Institute of International Studies in Monterey, California. I teach on the MA TESOL program here, and I'm really grateful to Hugh Javis for kindly inviting me to deliver this talk. This talk is based on an article which I wrote and which was recently published in the journal System. It was part of a special issue on SLA Learner Beliefs, which was guest edited by Anna Maria Barcelos and Paula Galaja. The title of my article is Using Language Ideology and Positioning to Broaden the SLA Learner Beliefs Landscape, the Case of an ESL Learner from China. I invite you to read this article as well as the other articles which appeared in the special issue of System. Now, let me give you a little bit of introduction in terms of theory to this paper. Rod Ellis notes that learners' beliefs are different in that they are neither an ability nor a trait-like propensity for language learning. Acknowledging the complexity of this construct, I will briefly address the three approaches, normative, metacognitive, and contextual, which were mapped out by Barcelos 2003, and then I will go on to elaborate on the third approach by analyzing the beliefs of an ESL immigrant learner from China. To assist me, I turn to two constructs, language ideology and positioning. First, the normative approach. In this approach, beliefs are primarily viewed as preconceived notions, myths or misconceptions. Barcelos 2003 adds that learners are judged according to an autonomous learner ideal, while beliefs are seen as impediments to learner autonomy. Generally, beliefs within this approach are measured through the use of Likert-style questionnaires, such as the Beliefs About Language Learning Inventory designed by Elaine Horwitz. However, the use of questionnaires has come under criticism. Kalaja, 1995, for instance, has argued that questionnaires only measure beliefs in theory and not actual occasions of talk or writing, while Benson and Law, 1999, find questionnaires inadequate in capturing the complexity of learners' thinking about language learning. Next, the metacognitive approach. Like the normative approach, beliefs in this approach are seen as a mental trait. A key underlying assumption is that learners think about the language learning process and are able to articulate some of their beliefs. While earlier research, such as Wendon 1919, sorry, 1986, focus on types of learner beliefs, later research attempted to classify learner beliefs and link them to metacognitive knowledge. Beliefs within this approach have generally been examined through the content analysis of self-reports in semi-structured interviews. While the use of interview data represents a promising development in that it allows for a better understanding of learner beliefs. One weakness of this approach is that it infers beliefs only from intentions and statements, not from actions. Third, the contextual approach. The first two approaches share the notion of beliefs as cognitive entities to be found inside the minds of language learners. By contrast, the contextual approach focuses on the dynamic and social aspects of beliefs. This approach takes into consideration how macro factors influence the development of beliefs. However, two shortcomings of the research within this approach thus far have been one, the lack of focus on the political and international aspects of language learning, and two, the failure to fully explore how macro and micro level dimensions of learner beliefs work interactively to impact language learning over extended periods of time. These considerations need to be counted for given the discursive turn in SLA. Such a discursive agenda can be advanced by the use of two constructs, language ideology and positioning which originate from linguistic anthropology and discursive psychology, respectively. Language ideology. Language ideologies, according, according to Alexandra 
Rajati relate to a wide range of phenomena that include one, ideas about the language, nature of language itself, two, the values and meanings attached to particular codes, three, hierarchies of linguistic value, and four, the way that specific linguistic codes are connected to identities and stances. I argue that ideologies offer a window into exploring how beliefs, one, change over time, two, are reflected on an interactional level, and three, are influenced by macro and micro political factors. Positioning. Now, this is another useful concept in refining our understanding of learner beliefs. McKay and Wong, 1996, have called for an examination of how learners are both positioned by powers, relations of power, and are resistant to that positioning. Specifically, several SLA studies draw on Davis and Horace's 1990 positioning theory, which takes into account how learners position themselves, which they describe as intentional self-positioning, and how these learners, in turn, position others, which they describe as interactional positioning. Now, like language ideologies, positioning theory allows SLA researchers to examine how micro and macro political factors shape learner beliefs over an extended period of time. Having established my theoretical framework, I turn now to my research context. For this paper, I drew on a year-long ethnographic case study which I conducted in 2008. This study involved five immigrant students, three from China, one from Vietnam, and another from Indonesia. These students were enrolled in an English medium school, which I call Orchid Girls Secondary School. As recipients of Singapore government scholarships, these students were expected to develop a standard variety of English. I had three research questions, and they are What linguistic practices are valued and denigrated in the school, and what are the language ideologies embedded in these practices? The second research question is How are these immigrant students positioned by others in the school, and how do they in turn position others? And the third research question is In what ways do these discursive positionings and language ideologies influence their learning outcomes? My data comprised audio and videotaped classroom interactions, field notes based on excursion observations, field notes based on general school observations, student and teacher interviews, and finally artifacts produced by the students. And this included written work that they, they produced, as well as their progress reports. In reciprocation for their participation, what I did was I conducted supplementary English lessons uh, and organized excursions for the immigrant students. I also offered my own input on lesson planning when consulted by the teachers. In my paper, I focused on just one of my focal learners, Jenny, who came from China. Like her other immigrant counterparts, Jenny arrived in Singapore in November 2007 and attended a month-long English immersion course organized by the school. She did this before starting the new school year in January 2008. Age 16 at the time of the study, she was enrolled in a secondary three class. Having attended a private school in Chongqing, China, where she had 45-minute English lessons every day, Jenny was able to achieve a proficiency level that enabled her to pass the English diagnostic test and the, selected, and the selection interview, which were administered by Singapore education officials. For the remainder of this talk, I will focus on Jenny's experiences over the course of the school year and illustrate the effects that ideologies and positionings had on her learning. McGarty, 2010, posits that language ideologies do not exist in a vacuum and that language ideologies, in fact, overlap with other core beliefs and related agendas. My focal learners were situated in a school which implemented a national English language syllabus. 
This syllabus sought to develop, and I quote here from the Ministry of Education Syllabus 2001, students who could speak, write, and make presentations in internationally acceptable English that is grammatical, fluent, and appropriate for the purpose, audience, context, and culture. Interestingly, the student, the syllabus aims were manifested in my interview with Mrs. Tay, uh, Jenny's English teacher. Mrs. Tay's interpretation of good English encompassed having good vocabulary and syntactic variation. Now, language ideologies and positioning, as I mentioned earlier, were instantiated in interview and classroom talk. I first discussed some interview data before moving on to classroom interaction data. Ideologies instantiated in interviews. At the school, standard English was seen to have had a higher value than the local variety of Singaporean English, which is widely known as Singlish. In an interview with Jenny, I asked her what constituted good English. Her answer was not Singlish. Jenny's ideology would, was therefore aligned with the official standard English language ideology of the school. However, she conceded that English had crept into her linguistic repertoire. Also evident during my interview with her was Jenny's determination to position herself as a non-Singlish speaker as she went on to elaborate on how Singapore people do not use good English. In other words, people from Singapore were positioned by her as poor users of English. As mentioned earlier, language ideologies are also closely conduct connected to identities and stances. This is illustrated in another interview excerpt where Jenny was asked why she wanted to learn English. This was her response. In China, Many big companies need people who can speak English well. As noted earlier, the English language syllabus sought to produce students who would be well versed in internationally acceptable English. And citing the reason to learn English to secure a job in an internationally oriented company in China, Janet seemed to position herself as a cosmopolitan striver, an identity that interestingly, was in line with the national educational agenda. Next, I discuss stretches of classroom interaction talk because, as I found to point it out, ideologies are also instantiated in classroom interaction. I also urge you, though, to refer to the article which contains a transcript of the talk. My main contention is Jenny's ideologies about English was shaped and in turn shaped the architecture of group talk. During group discussions, I found that Jenny was able to position herself as a participant in what Wallace 2002 calls literate talk. I observed that Jenny's use of English reflected her ideologies about English. In fact, her use of English epitomized what Mrs. Tay, her English teacher, if you remember, uh, saw as constituting good English, which, as I mentioned, was seen to be good vocabulary and syntactic variation. To her advantage, Jenny had the opportunity to move from one communicative success to another over the course of the school year. Importantly, her ideologies about English and how she, she positioned herself worked collaboratively to enhance her use and learning of English. What were the effects of ideology and positioning on Jenny's learning outcomes? In an interview at the end of the school year, I asked Mrs. Tay to rate my focal student's performance. Jenny was positioned as a star performer by Mrs. Tay and singled out as the student who made the most progress over the year. In short, Jenny's collective efforts to improve her English appear to have paid off, thereby further illustrating the power of language ideologies. So what conclusions can we draw from this study? 
I, for one, argue that new theoretical tools need to be used to investigate, one, the dynamic and discursive nature of beliefs, two, the political implications of language learning, and three, how macro and micro political factors work collectively to influence learning outcomes. To address this gap, I believe that an expanded learner belief framework guided by the constructs of language ideology and positioning can help advance SLA research. As this study demonstrated, or has demonstrated, Jenny's beliefs did not exist only in her head. Rather, they were discursively constructed through her negotiation with the various social actors with whom she came into contact. Now, looking ahead, I would also add that research on the embodied realities of learners needs to be conducted. Such re research should be part of a larger agenda to explore effect in SLA. In other words, future learner beliefs research should also look at how beliefs and effect in influence learning outcomes. Next, future research on learner beliefs should take on an ethnographic dimension. This will contribute to an enriched understanding of immigrant learner beliefs and how they ultimately impact language learning outcomes. On this note, I'd like you to take the time to thank you uh, for listening to my talk. And I certainly look forward to receiving any questions or comments that you may have for me.